Aloha and good morning, and welcome to the Hawaii Island Chamber's Young Professionals Committee um, Q&A session with Ross Birch. The title of our presentation today is Hawaii Island Tourism Today and Tomorrow. So today we have Ross Birch, Executive Director of the Island of Hawaii Visitors Bureau. Ross Birch is responsible for overseeing the Island of Hawaii Visitor Bureau's marketing and associated programs impacting the island's visitor industry, serving as the lead liaison between the island's stakeholders and the Hawaii Visitors and Convention Bureau. He also oversees the development of relationships with community leaders, government officials, and visitor industry marketing partners. Birch has over 25 years of hospitality experience on the Hawaii island. Most recently, he was the general manager of Makalei Golf Club, where he oversaw all facets of the, of the club, including marketing and operations of the 18-hole golf course and its facilities. Prior to that, he was president of the Hawaii Golf Connection, a group travel company that attracts golf travelers to Hawaii Island and assists them with all post-arrival arrangements. Birch also held positions as the director of golf sales and retail for Manolani Resort and the head golf professional at Waikoloa Beach Resort. He has also served on the, the IHBB's Board of Directors for more than 10 years, with four years spent on the board's executive committee as marketing committee chair, board, com board chair, and immediate task chair. Birch also serves on numerous charitable and community organizations. Please welcome Ross Birch. Aloha. Thanks, Dennis. Appreciate the opportunity to, to speak to the, the group today, um, to give a little bit of an update on what's going on, um, what we've seen, where we've been, and where we plan to go. Um, I'm gonna share my screen here, and I have lots of good information and slides that will be um, great references down the line for anybody with the presentation. including some very good analysis from destination analysts that uh, are really tracking uh, the potential for visits and what the sentiment is for visitation down the line. Everybody see my screen all right? Okay, so I'm gonna, as you can see, there's a lot of uh, material to cover here. I've got, uh, I'll go over the current situation, the statistics we had February, March, and then also April, May, June tracking, uh, airlift update, kind of give you an idea on what the seats are, what they were and where they are today, cruise line update. Um, in this process, uh, HDA and HVCB and IHVB and about any other uh, tourism related acronym you can think of has been really supporting the, the, the COVID mitigation uh, monitoring the arrival process, we're um, basically uh, suspending all of our marketing as well. So I'll go into that a little bit. And then some of the things we've been working on in the meantime, as far as getting the word out about how great um, the mitigation process has been going, the individuals that are the frontline service workers that um, are accredited and, and should be congratulated for the job well done. Uh, and we also will get into the messaging we've put forth worldwide, basically our Share Aloha campaign, which is, you know, we, we want to share our Aloha. We want everybody to realize that we're here, but right now is not necessarily the best time to come and we'll look forward to that day. And the next steps, that's where the market research is being compiled what our strategy is gonna be put together once we can get to a turning point. And then um, a little bit of a prognostication or some guesswork. Um, I know that most of the conversations I had, they are asking us to have a little bit of a crystal ball type of mentality when we're answering some of these questions as well. So that'll give a little bit of a, a feeling there and then truly the next steps moving forward after that. So February of 2020, our year-to-date numbers, as you can see, we were doing extremely well and we were 
14.4% up in total expenditures over year to date 2019. 2020 was the first two months were the best two months that our island has ever seen. The numbers, all numbers in all categories were up to levels that were gonna set records. So we were at an all time high point and within a short period of time are on the opposite side. So going into March, you can always already see that the slide had started to happen. So we've already dropped within one month. Uh, we dropped uh, almost 45 to 50% or more in all of the different categories um, from the previous month. So our numbers had already been trending down for time period in March. And then you can see here, this is our domestic um, numbers. These are statewide numbers. So at the beginning of the year, we were hitting that 30,000 visitor mark. And then again, in February, we peaked again at 30,000 total visitors um, coming to the state. And then you can see a drastic drop right in that mid-March time period. The international side, so our Japan market, our Asia market, Oceania, all of the international put together was starting to see a little bit of a drop earlier on uh, in, in February or other months, mainly because they were seeing the impact locally in their own uh, regions and areas. So it wasn't necessarily uh, to the point it was from a U.S. market. It was already starting to drop. We saw a lot less travel coming from China, Korea, Japan, and then also our Oceania partners were dropping, and then Europe on the same token were having their own issues as well. So that started a little bit earlier, but also got to about the same point and dropped. So as a combined, you can see how much of, of our total arrivals are really based off of the domestic side and how drastic of a drop it was right in the mid-March area. This is kind of a tracking we do on a day-by-day -day basis, percentage year over year. Um, at, from middle April to middle May, we were already at 0% on international market and hovering between the one and two and then up to 3% into May compared to previous years. And then as we're tracking from end of May through current date in June, we're getting a little bit more increase in total arrivals, but not necessarily visitation. So you can see from a hotel performance standpoint as well, um, almost tracks identically to the total overall arrival process and by the end of March, we kind of hit our bottom when it came to occupancy and we're also starting to hit that trough on the ADR, um, the average daily rate for the hotels as well. So it kind of went hand in hand compared to 2019, which was a nice steady flow all the way across the board there. You can see that our Occupancy levels for the island at 16.8% is actually pretty high, but truly we only have three hotels that are open at this point, and they're the only ones that are reporting. So all of the hotels that are closed have not been reporting, so those numbers would be completely different if we had the full spectrum of what um, the inventory would reflect. Um, and the ADR is, is 157.57, which is typically in the mid 200s. And the rev par is typically around 180, and we're at $26.54 per occupied room. And then the unemployment, this is just uh, the claims for the week of June 13th, uh, still trending pretty high. We're still seeing quite a bit of. Um, claims after the initial claims were going through. These are all new claims that are being done on each one of the counties and then overall statewide. 
what we're finding from the unemployment standpoint is the, the CARES Act and the PPP really helped us uh, get people uh, back to work for a period of time, but without reopening and without certain situations being in place, many of those individuals are now going back on unemployment because those uh, businesses are not able to stay open uh, at the same capacity. Now, air seats, um, we were trending the same way, not just with arrivals, but with air seats. You can see for Kona, in February, we had almost 115,000 direct air seats. This does not, this does not include inter island at all. This is just direct access, all from mainland and from international combined. March had already dropped 17%. And then as um, April, May, and June have all been the same where we're hovering with four direct flights a week from Delta Airlines, which equals about 1,592 seats. So we've dropped 98% in our direct access airlift coming into Kona. And for Hilo, the month of March, we dropped in half. And then April, May, and June have all been at zero. So the United flight basically was canceled in mid-March and hasn't resumed. And so currently, um, in our island flights, We've actually bumped up since the reduction of the 14 day quarantine for Inner Island. We're now up to six daily uh, round trip Honolulu, one round trip Maui, um, four round trip Honolulu, and one round trip Maui on Southwest. And then we still currently have our one direct Delta flight into Kona. And then for Hawaiian, in, or for Hilo, Hawaiian is running five dailies, and then Southwest is running two dailies, and United has been still canceled with no confirmation of uh, official restart. Uh, cruise industry, um, the, the title says it all right there, the cruise industry is really taking a beating, um, not just from the situations and incidents they've had, but the sentiment moving forward as far as a, a safe way to travel or a safe way to experience travel. Um, cruise lines are definitely uh, having major challenges in those areas. So what that does for Hawaii is we're looking at um, most likely the Pride of America NCL being our only option uh, for Hawaii cruising in 2020 and will most likely won't start until September or after because they're going through a dry, dry dock at this period and the CDC has put into place many major stipulations that each one of the cruise lines have to implement in order to start cruising again. What have we been doing lately? Um, our team has gone from being the marketing entity and enjoying those wonderful uh, high arrival numbers and great spending numbers to basically coming down to being the trackers of the 14-day quarantine. Um, when, the, when this all came about and we enforced the 14-day quarantine on the state level for incoming passengers and inner island, um, there needed to be ent an entity and individuals that could step up and slide right into it. And us being closest related to the visitor industry, um, Hawaii Tourism Authority hopped in and its staff, the HVCB staff and all the island chapter staff are currently working a call log and we're tracking anywhere from each island up to 900 plus visitors and intended residents on their 14 day quarantine. So we have a process where as they arrive at the airport, we, we collect the data we input it into a spreadsheet that we're following up on and each individual will get three calls over the 14 day process so that we can monitor um, their health for one, but we can also monitor that they are adhering to the 14 day quarantine. And if there's any uh, issues that arrive, our staff is typically the one that will escalate a situation and send it to the authorities. So many of the, um, 
I wouldn't say many of the arrests, but many of the um, situations that have occurred on our island has initiated from our offices, basically um, going through that process. So as an island, um, from March 26th, when we started this process, we've had 1,275 visitors total over a 90-day period. So on an average, we've only had 14 visitors per day uh, for the last three months. It doesn't sound like a lot, but when they're all lumped together and we have major large arrivals, we'll get uh, anywhere from 40 to 50 uh, and on any given day. Um, but that's minuscule compared to the amount of visitors we were getting on a daily basis. So, so you can kind of see the trend that we had initially. This was at the very beginning of the 14-day um, quarantine, and you could see how it tracked down with a few um, bigger arrivals that came in here with individuals that still kept their uh, vacation plans, really thinned out for almost a month through from mid-April to mid-May. And now we're actually starting to see our arrival numbers increase again. Um, a lot of returning residents and more and more visitors, but the visitor category is truly those that are coming. They do have uh, friends and family that they're visiting and they're staying in their homes. So it's, it's not visitors who are coming here intending to be on vacation. They're still visitors because within the category, if they have an address that's not Hawaii, they're still considered a visitor, even though they are family or they are friends or they're related to someone in the islands. Part of that process is everyone that comes off of the airline has to sign the order of self-quarantine. So every line in the proclamation that requires someone to be quarantined for 14 days, it lines up the very specifics that that in individual will need to adhere to. Each one needs to be initialed and signed off on and then also um, verified by an individual at the airport that's from the DOT. This is the new declaration form. So the old AG form is now going to be this form uh, moving on where we capture the information for tracking. Uh, gives us uh, as much information as we can to get the process rolling and understand where the person is coming from, where they're staying, how long, and any other specific situations that we need to follow. Inner Island, uh, the new process with Inner Island is going to be more of a trace tracking rather than a 14-day quarantine. So this form is the form that's going to be used when you travel Inner Island. It's mainly to so you can complete some uh, medical questions uh, and some travel-related questions as well. And then that will go into a different database to be followed up on um, most likely only after a situation of uh, a COVID um, occurrence happens. Moving into the, the marketing side a little bit, um, as you can see us putting the brakes on completely from the arrival process, um, almost telling people to stay away rather than to come. Um, this is a letter that was sent to the industry partners, um, the airlines, the wholesalers, the travel agents, and our media outlets, basically letting them know that, you know, we appreciate whatever they have, but we would prefer not to have any press at this time or to contact us with any questions you have. So and, and from a travel agent standpoint, um, notify your future guests. The proactive marketing that we've been doing is more locally based. So we started with a campaign early on and we did a one page ad in all of the local papers um, with hashtag live Aloha. And it's basically touting the frontline uh, service individuals and, and the jobs that they're doing to help keep our communities safe, secure, and uh, give a great appreciation for that. 
there was also a um, advertisement that went along with this on local TV stations as well. And then Share Aloha is a video that was created um, for the process of basically letting the world know that we're here. We want to share our aloha, wish we could have the opportunity to do it face to face, but at this time, uh, we prefer to keep our distance and that once we are ready to go, we'll be welcoming with open arms. So I'll come back to this at the end if we have time to do the, the video. Otherwise, it's on all of our social media platforms and you can find it there. So our next steps, um, actually wave one, one, two, three have basically already kind of uh, been implemented. It's what I was just talking about there as far as uh, uh, the mitigation, um, the campaigns we've created, the sharing Aloha, and that will continue and we'll still be using facets of that, breaking down the video into different um, portions, putting it into different platforms. Uh, and then what we're really doing right now is we're taking um, all the different travel sentiment and data we can collect to really focus our efforts on the markets once we start to reopen on what's gonna give us the greatest return and actually from the direction of the state, county and other entities, the uh, major market areas that we may be going after. In the interim, one more thing that we're doing is we've created a combine of special offers. Uh, this is a statewide program. Uh, our island has, I think, 15 to 20 offers that are on this page already. So you can go to this website uh, and select the island and it'll give a list of what uh, and, and who are offering um, Kama'aina um, great deals. And I will send it actually so that the chamber could send this out as well because we're trying to do more of a grassroots type of presentation. We're really not even spending a whole lot of marketing money uh, in local media. Um, so we will send it out, make sure that all of the chamber members have an opportunity to see these great specials. And then the Coronavirus Travel Sentiment Index uh, destination analysts have been tracking week by week a similar database of individuals to, to track their sentiment on how it, it changes from week to week depending on what media influences are, depending on the situation as far as what different areas are seeing increases or decreases um, in their case counts and it's been a really good tool for us to kind of see where the rest of the country is for this. Um, this will be more you can dive in, I think, once, once I can provide the, the slide deck to everybody there. So we've got 47.7% of travelers expect things to get worse last week first uh, than the week prior to that. So we're seeing a trending now with some of the spikes that are coming in other areas that the sentiment is our, our individuals are feel, feeling overall that the situation is getting worse instead of better. This kind of shows you that trend over the week's period where it was getting worse and then got majorly better, came through the process, and then you can see that we're trending back up again now, back in June. And I think you're gonna see hot spots that are coming up like Florida, Texas, uh, some places in California are really what's kind of driving that is that the numbers are now getting back to almost similar to, if not exceeding what the original counts were in those areas. Um, thinking about the current coronavirus situation in general, how concerned are you about your friends or family contracting the virus? Um, there is definitely a major concern. You can see that there's uh, a major increase of almost 73.1%. Um, the previous week was right up there as well, but it had been lower, much lower in previous weeks. And I picked a few slides out of the entire presentation. So there's a lot more detailed information and more um, 
different categories that you can pick up from uh, this research. And one of the things I picked up on was am I, I am comfortable with my home state reopening its economy right now. So it looks like since June, it was trending in a very positive direction up until June 5th. And then it started to, to go in a negative direction again um, as we start working into the, the, the following weeks. So as people start to reopen, the case counts go up. You can see that the trend is already there. How much do you agree with the following? I do not want travelers coming to visit my community right now. Uh, this one is actually in our favor and has continued even though the process of the cases have increased, they're still showing that it's moving in the positive direction that they still want people to come into their community or are trending in that direction. At this moment, how safe would you feel doing each one of these types of activities? This is kind of a, a snapshot of what people are really considering as safe uh, opportunities, going shopping, visiting friends and relatives, taking a road trip, uh, non-team outdoor recreation are the, basically the top four things that people are doing. Uh, staying in a hotel, amazingly, is, is, is at the top level as well. Dining in a restaurant. So there's a great comfort level there. I'm actually very interested in that one, that staying in an Airbnb or, or a home rental has slightly less of a safety sentiment than staying in a hotel does. So as you can see, there's a wide uh, spectrum of different um, categories and it kind of shows what it is. And you can see traveling on a cruise line is the furthest thing from what someone is really trying to uh, head towards as they're looking at doing an activity. Um, I'm planning to avoid all travel until the coronavirus situation blows over. Um, honey. So this one is more in line with individuals who believe in waiting for a um, vaccine before they do anything or they intend to travel. The good news is it's still been trending in a very positive way for all of us is that people are getting less and less avoiding uh, travel until it blows over and uh, both categories are working in the right direction. Even if only tentatively scheduled, in which months of this year would you currently plan on, on taking a leisure trip? Within this last week, um, you can see that it actually dipped. So the orange bar shows that the sentiment for taking a trip has actually dropped um, since the previous week, but had been working in a positive direction towards that. And then they have no plans to travel in 2020. Um, basically is saying that most individuals are looking now at first and second quarter 2021 before they um, take a real leisure vacation. The pandemic's influence on travel, what Americans say that they will avoid when traveling this year. They're gonna avoid cruises, crowded destinations, areas hardest hit by the coronavirus, attending conferences, and places with sanitary issues. So the good news for us is I think we score higher as a destination and location uh, compared to all of those different categories. What are the three U.S. travel destinations, if any, that, that you have been most talked about uh, as places with coronavirus issues? Uh, you can see Hawaii is way down in that conversation. New York, Florida, California, obviously the, the top and then specific cities occasionally here. Um, Hawaii in general has been extremely low uh, and then dropped even further in May because of our, our great mitigation and has, has only risen just slightly in the last few weeks. So we're in a great position from this standpoint. Please think about your interest in visiting destinations for the first time, destinations you are familiar with. 
Um, this is, again, helps us out as well because we are a destination many people are familiar with. Our return visitor ratio is about anywhere between 72 and 75%. So that gives us a great customer base on familiarity and, and comfort level. So we fit into this category on the positive side. And then if you're from a convention standpoint, this is still something that's that's a could be a challenge down the line. We have a lot of convention business for our island. And if you're asked to attend a convention or conference this fall, um, the percentages are still leaning into the the neutral or very unhappy. It's it's pretty much flat across the board, but we need to have other um, mitigation processes in place and other the rules redefined so that we can see the very happy and happy to attend a little bit on the higher side for us. And then this one is specific to islands. So visit in the past three years and then likely to visit in the next three years. This is, uh, we're at the top of this category uh, on both sides. So of those who are surveyed, Hawaii is one of the top destinations or islands that they have visited. And it'll be one of the locations that they will revisit even more strongly so uh, in that category. I think there's a huge comfort level in that once we start getting back to allowing visitors. So where do we go from here? Uh, as you can see, the data has been ever changing. It continues to show tourism recovery being pushed back month by month. Uh, that's been kind of the process we've been going. We're hoping that we're gonna get some type of specific um, direction and timing within the next week uh, to start the process of the reopening. Uh, and our, our goal is to continue to evaluate this preliminary generic travel data and create an in-depth in-market research program specifically for Hawaii that will direct us in our marketing strategy. So getting more specifically, the three different categories we go from is taking this data, taking more specific data and questions we're gonna develop and go into market with. So those questions are gonna be focused around the destination inspiration, you know, what, what inspires them to travel, what are going to be their, their bucket list or hot buttons um, when it does come time for them to travel? Uh, and we'll match up our marketing to do those. Uh, what is the process of selection of the destination? We'll go through and ask a bunch of questions uh, in those categories to try to define um, how they're making their selection, if it's specific platforms, if it's uh, different areas or uh, different demographics, we'll nail it down and figure out what those are. And then from Hawaii specific on the, the consideration as well, um, what's gonna move the needle? What, what is it gonna be, what are we gonna need to take to close that deal uh, when it comes down to it? So those, that's the process we have and have been actually doing this research specifically for Hawaii so that we can get our marketing uh, lined out. Uh, what our best guesses are uh, moving forward on the general travel, the drive to destinations, we'll see the visitors first. Uh, obviously, there's a huge uh, sentiment for travelers to be uh, in their own vehicles rather than traipsing through airports or stuck on a, an aircraft for two to five hours at a time. Uh, travelers are definitely gonna be attracted to the less congested destinations. City centers are gonna be uh, probably low on that list. They'll be looking for more outdoor opportunities or uh, rural uh, opportunities. And then locations that have less lesser COVID-19 cases uh, and also have stronger processes in place of mitigation. Uh, and then we need to have precautions in place in airlines and airports and uh, hotels and every touch point basically from an individual that's going to be on vacation or traveling here uh, 
have certain standard levels of, of cleanliness and uh, protocols. For our island specific, our, our hotels will remain closed as long as there's a 14 day quarantine um, truly in place. We do have a few that might open within July, more in August, and then uh, many are waiting until um, third quarter, well into third quarter or even fourth quarter. Um, the previous bookings we've had for the third and fourth quarters are still strong. They've held steady, um, waiting for more specific information so that they can either go forward with it or, or push them back. Uh, groups that were scheduled for spring have moved to fall and will probably continue to move into first and second quarter of 2021. So we haven't seen a whole lot of losses, but more um, rebookings. Uh, airlines will ramp up slowly, limited flights through the end of June. We're going to basically stay with the same schedule through June. Um, the airlines that are flying to Hawaii have got, received an exemption from the CARES Act, which and was the CARES Act was enforcing airlines to uh, still use rural airports for their flights and maintain a certain level of flights. Hawaii was exempt from that, which meant the airlines were not required to fly to Lihui, Maui, or Kona, or Hilo in this reopening process. So there was no requirement for that. Um, and although they have the exemption, multiple airlines are choosing to fly to the neighbor islands as they're bringing up um, their total capacities statewide. Um, and more specifically, our airlines are looking at starting um, resumption of at least four more direct flights from the mainland key areas as early as July 7th. So we've got some airlines that are ready to fly and they, can, they see the demand already starting to come back. Uh, initial price points for airfare accommodations um, will need to be competitive in order to kind of help seal that deal. Travel demand is still strong, including Hawaii as a destination. People, although they have the issues, they, they still want to travel and create unique experiences allowing social distancing. So we're going to have to revamp what the new normal is for us. And instead of having 200 individuals at, at any given place at Hawaii Volcanoes National Park, there's gonna to have to be a process put in place from certain level of gatherings. And then small group activities, I think our, our activity providers are gonna to have to be very creative when it comes to uh, how many they can have within a group, how many they can have in a certain vehicle and um, being able to create an experience around that. So, where do we want to be? So the conversation has been out there as well is we've, we're at a position where we've got a clean slate. Obviously when we're only at 5% of what our visitation has been in the past, um, we're basically at zero we're starting from scratch. All of our parks and attractions have been closed. Accommodations for the most part have been closed or restricted. And then moving forward, the, the focus on our side, even from a marketing standpoint, is we're gonna focus on fewer visitors, spending more money um, to drive uh, the better experience. Um, resident sentiment has been an issue and is criti critical for us as we move forward that our residents feel the value of what the, the visitors are bringing. Uh, cultural and natural resources are definitely gonna be included in this process. Uh, our brand development and management will include all those as well. And then economics, the, the, the economics 101, which, which I've referred to a lot of times is the su supply and demand side. And what really drives visitation is not airlines, it's more accommodations. If we want to limit a certain number of visitors, we'll, we need to limit or have an idea of control of what the inventory of room count is. The airlines will adjust to whatever that is. The airlines follow demand where the hotels are the ones who create the demand. So we have to start at the point of creation. 
And then new jobs can be created to support management of the visitor attractions. Um, I see down the line as far as um, keeping control of these areas, making sure that we have only a certain amount of individuals that can be at, at any park or in any location at a certain time, we're gonna have to set up a program uh, that will allow security uh, to monitor that as well as um, creating positions for individuals for interpretation. You know, I, I think part of the value of what we have as a destination is if you're standing in a location, but you don't know exactly what you're looking at or what you're experiencing, and we have some local individuals that can translate that for you and explain this is what the sense of place is and what the significance of the area is, will it really enhance the overall experience for our visitors. Whoo! Ran through that. Thank you so much for, for letting me uh, talk to those points. Thank you, Ross. So, um, you know, this data is important for us to understand because, you know, a lot of times we just hear in the news, you know, visitor arrivals are, is this much, but how is it overall impacting the industry, right? So, you know, we now have a person that actually works in the industry that's going to be doing the moderation of the Q&A. So I have Samantha Collins, who is the group sales manager at the Fairmont Orchid. So take it away, Sam. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Ross. Um, so great presentation, very informative. And, uh, you know, like Dennis said, uh, a lot of these stats go out there in the news, but we all don't necessarily, if you're not working in the industry, understand what they are. So um, we've had a couple of questions come through via uh, the Facebook Live already. And um, I'm going to start there, Ross. And a lot of it kind of spins off of what you just shared. So let's start with... Um, a question that came through that says, what is the maximum amount of available air seats uh, or percentage of air seats that are available? You kind of touched on that in, in your presentation. Um, so maybe if you want to go back to that really quickly and uh, share that information. Yeah, so for, from an inner island standpoint, we're at about 50% of the capacity we had in February. So um, typically we had about um, 12 to 16 flights round trip daily out of both Hilo and Kona, when we're down to about half of that currently for Inner Island. Uh, from a mainland direct access standpoint, we're at about 2% capacity of where we were in February. So we've lost almost okay. everything except for one Delta flight going into Kona four days a week. Yeah. Uh, and you can definitely see that as you drive around the Big Island, right? Uh, not a lot of cars on the road besides the few essential workers that are out there, people getting their business done. Anyhow, um, another question that came through, uh, have hotels, the tourism driven businesses been legally required to provide refunds or rescheduling options to customers? Because I know you mentioned there are only about three hotels, I think, that are currently open on the island. Um, so uh, are you aware of uh, any you know, legal uh, requirements for these businesses to refund or reschedule for customers? There really aren't any legal obligations. Um, it's more within each individual hotel or accommodations policies. And, and I, in our process of going through this, uh, have had many conversations with individuals booking um, a standalone vacation rental that has a little bit more of a restrictive contract and policy where they have held deposits and prepayments because of their contract stipulations. Uh, we found that, that most of the hotels and many of the accommodations, probably up to about 95, if not more percent of those accommodations have gone above and beyond and almost reached out to the visitors or the potential visitors that are gonna be on their books and have rescheduled them um, in advance or have made accommodations for cancellation and full refunds in those process. So although there aren't any laws, I think our, our partners have been very accommodating. Awesome. Okay, uh, another one that came through, uh, just a few more right now uh, from Facebook and then we'll, we'll jump over. 
to a few other questions that were sent in prior, but um, are the hotels considering opening for the local business or do they plan to wait until tourism or tourists are allowed back without the 14 day quarantine? It seems like they could be filling rooms with the local support right now. What are your thoughts on that, Ross? I've, I've had conversations with multiple properties in different levels and there are properties who are um, more accommodating to the comma and the visitor. Um, I'll, I'll use a couple of different examples where uh, Hila or the, the Nani Loa Hotel and Hilo Hawaiian have both been open through this entire process. So they've been taking reservations and, and accommodating first responders and, and all of that. And they're in a great position to have a comma in a program and their price points are going to set up much better for that. Uh, now you take a hotel in Kona. Um, we have one hotel that's open currently, and absolutely they'd be open for uh, a combine program because they're they're already in that situation. They already have a certain level of workers that are already in place that are there. Um, the two other hotels are actually under construction, and they're going to hold off um, even themselves to a point of when they've been uh, refurbished before they start to open. Uh, and may not open just for combined purposes. They'll wait until there's a certain level of visitation that comes in. And then <clears throat> the Koala Coast is going to be very similar. I think there's maybe one hotel on the Koala Coast that has an opportunity for a combined program, but uh, most of those hotels uh, require a certain level of basically an ADR in order to get back to a certain level and not just an ADR, but you have to have a certain percentage of occupancy level to get back to before you can even bring individuals back to a certain level. They're gonna to need to have a booking window and a booking time to actually start ramping up reservations before they can start opening for any visitation, regardless if it's come in or other. So there's gonna be a process. And that Okay, so and that and just so that everyone who's maybe not in the industry understands the ADR and the occupancy, those they have to get to a certain level in order to basically break even, is what you're saying, right? It, um, and not lose money. Is that yeah. is that where you're going with that? Okay. And most of them would be by far in a lose money situation if they open to a 10 to 15 percent occupancy, making 50 percent of what their average ADR is. So that just in most businesses and most owners of those hotels will just look at that and say that, well, staying closed is a better position than if we start to reopen for we, in that situation. Okay. Um, and going to another Facebook question, um, are the hotel employees still on furlough or are some being laid off? Do you know anything about that? Ron? There's both. It's some are furloughed, some mm -hmm. are laid off. There's if, if you're it, and it's the unions versus non-union, it's a different situation there as well. Um, most of the hotels I know on the Koala Coast as well have continued their health care coverage for, for almost all employees and will continue that as I think for another month or so. Um, even though they're taking a big hit from that standpoint, but they have kind of gone above and beyond. I know most other hotels have done that. Um, what people don't realize as well from a business standpoint too, that um, only one or two of the hotels that we actually have, um, have qualified for the PPP. So the other ones just don't, don't make it. They don't qualify within the stipulations. So they had to do some more drastic um, layoffs and furloughs at that point and they won't bring back their employees until they start getting certain levels. The PPP on, on other situations, we've actually had a hotel that had that um, brought back employees. They used the PPP for a period of time. That runs out, they now have to go back into close. So they basically were, were quasi open, brought employees back to get to where they needed to get, but then they're gonna end up closing now because we have this gap between the time we can get visitation coming in. Okay. Okay. Uh, so going back to Kama'aina and hotels, since that's kind of the topic that we are on at the moment, um, someone wrote in and shared that, um, you know, for quite some time, the working class here has expressed that Kama'aina rates are still on the pricier side. Uh, you know, this is joined 
With a push and pull in popular opinion on the reliance of tourism dollars into our island community, are there plans that you're aware of us, um, amongst the hotels and resorts here on Hawaii Island as they reopen to offer lower than previous Kama'aina rates to encourage staycations, self-care uh, getaways, and uh, amongst the, the pandemic? Are you aware of that? Well, I, I, I think in answering my question a little bit earlier, it's that there's a certain price point level that it just doesn't um, make her, the sense. It, in past years as well, Kama'aina markets were used as a, a gap fill for seasonal tourism. So when you when the hotels are at running a 80, 80 to 85% occupancy through some of the peak seasons at higher rates, you start to find some of the shoulder seasons, Kama'aina rates start to, to filter into those areas. It's, it's just basically a stop gap and a fill type of market. It's not a, a go-to market. Uh, if, if I'm kind of explaining that, it, I, I don't know if you're following me or if I'm kind of leading everybody in a, yeah. a strange direction, but it's, it's been something that's been a nice offering in the past um, to get some combine activity or get local residents some accessibility and some opportunities. It's not necessarily a go-to market as a whole. So if I'm hearing you correctly, um, basically Kama'aina is not a go-to market, uh, so the hotels can't sustain on Kama'aina alone, right, is what you're saying? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, moving on, let's talk about your area a little bit more. And um, someone wrote in, with the de decrease in marketing dollars, what marketing strategies will you use to reassure visitors to visit Hawaii? I know you shared some of it. Maybe if you want to go back to, to some of those slides or... Well, the, the great news is, is we're seeing, I mean, what we're seeing is we're seeing a lot of people that have held reservations and have seen um, the willingness to want to travel to Hawaii. So we've got the demand working on that. Um, the process that we're going to have to go through is still, we're kind of still in that holding pattern. And we don't want to basically f flip the switch and say, okay, we're going to start marketing and bringing it back until we have a basically a cleared time when we know that um, we may not have to deal with a 14-day quarantine, that testing will be in place, that we have the opportunity to give them the experience that they're expecting. Right now, we're trying to feel that out as well. I, we're, we're definitely not going to give people um, what they're expecting if they're coming under a 14-day quarantine or if we're not going to have services completely open at the hotels or we're going to be giving half of a product. So we kind of have to work through this and we're not going to really ramp up for quite probably until the, the end of the third quarter, really with any strong marketing programs that we have. Okay. Uh, so another question, is there any way to monitor and police the safeguards that have been or will be instituted when the state reopens? I, I think property standards uh, are going to be set to a certain level. I think, uh, the industry itself is going to set a, a great standard. I think um, CDC is the start. Department of Health is the next level that comes in. Um, and I think we're going to have kind of an overall broad guideline. Um, our critical areas are really going to be uh, the airport and touch points uh, upon the arrival and departure. Uh, in between, I think our businesses and our hotels are really going to step up and do that. I think county facilities are gonna to have to go in line with that as well. I think there's gonna be an opportunity for the county to come in strong, um, making sure that their facilities and parks and everything are, are up to speed as well. Okay. Uh, visitor publications and social media have introduced guests to out of the way trails, places that have at times become either overused or dangerous. How will you use public relations to discourage guests from visiting places that are off-site? That is a very great question, a very tricky question, for one. Um, we, we don't use public relations or social media to combat any of that. Um, we don't promote those locations. We 
um, stay away from any type of um, photos. In our marketing, we avoid those touch areas where we're, that's kind of on a, in an area where we're staying away from rather than if we send a negative message saying to stay away from this area or no matter how we would word it, it would, it would not come off properly. And it would also start to attract more as well, because if they say, well, if you're telling me not to go, then I really have to go now. So by not saying anything is how we're using social media uh, to combat that. Okay. Uh, next question. Residents are somewhat, I believe, quietly uncomfortable with visitors. Maybe I'm wrong, but is there outreach to the community? Uh, would you consider exploring if such a negative attitude towards visitors exists? There has been, and there's actually statistics that show that. Resident sentiment um, has definitely, um, I don't know, I don't know if it's increased or decreased, but resident sentiment has been going in the direction of negativity towards visitation. And those statistics are something that we're judged by, that the Hawaii Tourism Authority that are really focused on. And as we start looking forward and looking at the finances we have and marketing dollars, we actually are, there's been a huge transfer from marketing funding to resident sentiment funding. So we're seeing more and more programs created to um, the mitigation of, of access to certain areas. There's more and more funding that's gonna be pushed towards education for the local community. And there's gonna be tie-ins from the visitor standpoint to the local communities, communities more on a direct basis. So the counties, uh, HDA, and then the visitor bureaus are all going to work hand in hand. And actually, there's actually greater funding for us to work on those programs than there is marketing moving forward. Okay. Uh, next question. When will you include vacation rentals in your marketing mix? Or why haven't you included them as alternative accommodations? That's another great question. And... <laughs> We don't specifically market any segment or any certain um, entities directly. Uh, we're marketing the destination. Um, we give opportunities to our partners to market themselves. So if you're seeing that there's, you, you see more marketing from certain hotels or different categories, it's because they're taking advantage more of those opportunities we're providing. We're not necessarily saying we're going to, we promote hotels or we promote bed and breakfast. We promote, we promote everything. We promote visitation to the island. Where you stay, where you eat, where you go, where you do your activity, that's all up to you. You're, however you find it and however you enjoy it is, is more up to you. Uh, is there a way to offer COVID testing to arrivals to shorten the 14-day quarantine? I believe there's a conversation going on right now as we speak about that. Um, okay. I believe that's all a part of the, uh, like, Lieutenant Governor, he's been promoting um, Travel with Aloha, that whole plan and package, right? That, is that what you're referring to? Yeah, it, it right now I think it's it's really stipulated on a partnership with a pharmacy on the mainland that has very consistent testing, has a, a database we can tap into, has a process that the visitors can go through with ease um, and being cleared in that process. I think the details still need to be worked out, but overall I think there's going to be a, a testing option, and quite honestly. I think the airlines and hotels, now that hotels or accommodations in general completely are as responsible for the individuals staying in them under the 14 day quarantine as the individuals are, we're gonna see that hesitation of hotels opening up again until there is a complete um, release of the 14 day quarantine or hotels will be requiring their guests to be tested as well 
to avoid that process. There's a huge liability that I see um, coming down the line if we still have a 14-day quarantine in place. Okay. Uh, just a few more questions, Russ. Uh, incoming travel exposure is significant, but so is the risk of Hawaii residents now being able to travel outside of the state and returning with the virus. Is there any more talk about designing safe travel bubbles and promoting this type of travel to our residents? Uh, if they have uh, island or rock fever, maybe they would be happy to travel to New Zealand or Australia, which have had very low or minimal cases. Any more thoughts there, or, or have you heard anything from your end? Well, I think travel bubbles are, are definitely part of the conversation as well. Um, mm -hmm. I think we have a challenge in a few different areas. Um, and and our, our focus is inbound rather than outbound. It's, it's even though those bubbles will allow both um, in and out, uh, it would allow myself actually to travel to some of those destinations and market maybe at some point if we had the bubble relationship. But but one being a state of the country and the, and the other countries having travel restrictions into the United States is gonna be a challenge for us to get over for one. Um, having a travel bubble between certain areas on the mainland as well that have lower counts is gonna be an issue seeing that there's free travel between the, the entire United States. So there's, bubbles are, are a good thought process, a way to, to keep similar um, type areas um, accessible, but I think it's going to be an enormous challenge logistically to make it happen. All right, and I think this might be the final question that I have, unless something else comes through uh, from Facebook, but uh, someone wrote in saying, I think there is concern that we will be challenged to care for tourists that might become ill once they arrive in our island. We obviously have limited ICU beds and other required resources or staffing to respond to a significant research in the pandemic. Unrealistic thought would be to implement a venue that we could send sick COVID-19 patients and their travel mates back to wherever they came from if they get sick while on vacation. Um, have you heard of any conversation about this, Ross, or um, uh, any ideas that have come up to solve this situation? Yeah, these, this would be more of the backroom type conversations that are having. And uh, from a number standpoint, um, visitors that are coming that are either infected or become infected are, are extremely low. We've 90 plus percent of the cases we have are travel related that visitors are, are re I should say residents are returning back to the islands and then are in a large family situation. So that's what we're finding in the statistics that that seems to be the greatest cause of um, contact or spread or even uh, the virus making its way to Hawaii. So visitors bringing it in is still low on that side. If we get a certain number that's contracted, I don't think there's any reason why we couldn't reach out to an airline and establish a charter flight that is basically a COVID flight to help get these individuals back to different parts of the mainland it, mm -hmm. we have the funding and COVID funding that I think would would help in that process so I don't think it'd be an issue okay all right well uh Dennis I think that's uh, all the questions I received at this point Ross we thank you for your time and uh I really appreciate your insight and, and everything that you and your team are doing to keep our island safe and then plan for what's next so from me thank you dennis over to you all right thank you sam and thanks again ross for you know taking time out of, it, out of your busy schedule to you know, give us an update on the tourism um here in hawaii at this time i want to thank you know our background guy you know jace takea of eclipse effect events and then especially uh thank you to sam who helped coordinate um ross and thank you to Taylor and Miles at the chamber. And with that, you know, thank you everybody for attending and have a nice day.